What's up, everybody? It is Friday. It is March 1st. We are kicking off a new month. It's a Friday, and for everybody who's new to the channel, welcome back, or welcome, or whatever. I can't... That made no sense to say welcome back. Uh, but every Friday, we do a wrap-up of what's going on in the week and add in a little extra flavor, too. And so, here we are. Uh, Microsoft had a big week. It actually started last Sunday with the HoloLens 2. 3500 bucks for this thing. And um, a lot of people are still getting a lot of feedback saying, I wish it was for the consumer. But the, but the problem is this thing is not ready for the consumer. Um, priority number one should be battery life. At two to three hours, this isn't something you're going to be walking down the streets of Manhattan wearing and having a grand old time. This is a, an enterprise product. Um, it, and the $3,500 price point might sound like a lot, but if you own a factory and you have people on the floor or first line workers, as Microsoft likes to call them, and you can remotely help them fix a solution, 3,500 bucks is a heck of a lot cheaper than have a technician come out on site and fix a, an assembly line or anything else like that, or having downtime. So yes, 3,500 bucks is a lot. I honestly bet that that's probably right around what it costs Microsoft to make them, because again, this is emerging technology, and Microsoft is trying to lead the way in what they hope is the next wave of computers or computing. And so if you're thinking, oh, Microsoft won't make any money on that. Well, we already know that they've made, they've inked a 480-ish million dollar contract with the U.S. government or the military uh, explicitly. And so, yeah, they're going to make money on this stuff. And that's that's why they're pushing ahead. And they are a, they're the leader of the industry right now with this. I, I don't know anybody else who's coming close that's, that's available. Now, we know that Apple and Google and everybody else on the planet is working on this stuff. But Microsoft has just set the bar of what the minimum expectations are for a launch product. And so we will see how this materializes. And the other way we know that this thing is absolutely an enterprise play. One, they didn't demo any games. If you remember when it launched, they demoed Minecraft and like this alien breaking through a wall thing. Uh, what did they demo this time was customer pro or solutions that are currently using it and Dynamics 365, which is Microsoft's ERP solution, which for most people is probably pretty yawn inducing, but it is kind of neat that they're bringing holograms to Dynamics 365. Uh, Microsoft's Chromium Edge browser, by the way, I think we're closer to seeing it than what most people might have let on. Like I, I had been hearing, we're not going to see this till the second half of um, 2019, like the late second half. I think we're going to see it before then. I, I'm growing more confident that we are going to see it sooner than that. Uh, when exactly? Still not quite sure, but it's uh, it's being tested internally, obviously, but being tested internally on a pretty wide band. So it's no longer just the, the strict devs who are working on it. A uh, couple things to note on the Xbox side, on the Xbox One side, you'll be able to grab Adventure Time Pirates uh, starting March 1 to the 31st, and uh, from March 16th to April 15th, you will be able to grab Planets, of, uh, Planets vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2. And then uh, you'll also be able to grab Star Wars Republic Commando and Metal Gear Rising as well uh, in the month of March. Nice little bonus there, right? Free games. It's kind of hard to argue with free games. Um, I typically download all these games. I don't know if I will play them, but they're free. And so you might as well go grab them while you can. So uh, one of the things I wanted to dive a little bit deeper in, I mean, that's kind of the high level news. Microsoft really focused around HoloLens 2. There was also Azure Sentinel that came out, by the way, uh, on the enterprise security side. It's a little bit of a mix of AI. It's a little bit of a mix of human. Uh, it's basically designed to help you safeguard your enterprise data from the growing threats that are coming out. But one of the things I wanted to dive deeper into this uh, on this episode is the future of the Microsoft Store. Uh, the, more, the more you think about this, the, the weirder this kind of narrative becomes. When Microsoft launched the store back with Windows 8, it was supposed to be the be-all, end-all solution for getting your applications on the in, in Windows, right? They were trying to replicate what is so popular on the mobile side with the App Store and Google Play and bring that over to Windows. And so it was on the Windows Mobile and it was also on the desktop, but now it's just basically on the desktop since mobile is dead. And what's the future of it? When they announced the HoloLens, they talked about how they are doing to this open store initiative. There's going to be a Microsoft store. Um, Epic or Epic could create their own store if they wanted. They even brought Tim Sweeney out on stage to talk about things like this. They're going to make third-party stores first-party clients, meaning that anybody can build an app store for HoloLens and it'll be representative as a first-party client, not some bolt-on solution. So right there, they're devaluing the Microsoft store on the HoloLens level. And then you go to their browser, Edgium. 
like Edgium, I call it that because it's Edge but based on Chromium, but Edgium. Uh, it is based on Chromium and it is not coming to the store. This is going to be serviced outside the store because it's just an application. It's going to work on Windows 7, 8, 10. Uh, it's just, a, I believe, just a .exe, so you can run it anywhere. So again, not in the store. Not in the store. Um, last, was it last week or, yeah, well, it was, I guess, February 8th, I believe, is when they started doing this. They Microsoft started doing this weird gaming demo thing where they gave State of Decay away for free. And I did a really good deep dive right up on this on Throt. There's also a video on this channel about why this is so important. But the, the thing you need to know here is that this application is in the, in the Microsoft Store, but it doesn't download from the Microsoft Store servers. It downloads from the Xbox servers, and it uses the Xbox plumbing to get it onto your machine. And then, once it's on your machine, it installs DirectX, which breaks the sandbox model that the Windows Store is supposed to use to maintain secure applications that they're not going to expose you to malware or viruses. So, right there, Microsoft's now completely breaking their own store model. Which kind of brings up the question is like, what's the future of Microsoft's universal Windows platform? Now that Windows Phone is dead, um, people, well, not even when it was alive, not many people were writing applications that ran on desktop and mobile. You, you could make the argument that, that maybe they could write them for that, and then they also run back here on the Xbox and uh, the, the HoloLens. But I, I don't see that being a, a priority, if you will, because... It just doesn't make sense. Microsoft hasn't talked too much about UWP. They've kind of devalued what a UWP is by allowing or, or building these desktop bridges, allow you to bring desktop applications into the store. But again, they're not like true store apps because they just used a bridge and they use a different packaging, but it's still kind of just a basic Win32 app under the hood. And so Microsoft is in this really awkward position. They've got multiple stores on the HoloLens. UWP is no longer a thing. Their upcoming web browser, which is going to be on every OS that they ship for the desktop client, is not coming through the store. They have Xbox games downloading that aren't coming from the store servers, and then they break the model. I mean, what what is the Microsoft Store now? I, I don't think Microsoft is ever going to just be like, hey, we're shutting this down, it, it's over. Uh, I think, one, that would be a huge black eye, it would be pretty embarrassing on their on their front, but the, the corporate the core values of what made the store the store are no longer there. So now it's just kind of this place that you can go to get some applications if you want. Um, it's still a good thing to grab apps from there because one, they can update in the background and they should be uh, malware free. But there's not, I, I don't know. It, it's They're really in this awkward position about what the future of the store is. And um, yeah, we'll see how this plays out. We really will. We will see. All right, I'm going to read a sentence to you, and you got to tell me what this sounds like. The ability to render high-quality, interactive 3D content and stream it to your device in real time. If you didn't know what I was talking about, you would probably assume that that is referring to Microsoft's xCloud service. Now, xCloud is their gaming game streaming platform in the cloud, which is going to stream interactive 3D content in real time. But what this... What this sentence actually comes from is a new service Microsoft launched with HoloLens called Azure Remote Rendering. So what this does is it uses the power of Azure, Microsoft's cloud platform, to render 3D content and then stream it to devices such as the HoloLens. That is exactly the same idea of xCloud. Now granted, there's a little bit more nuances to xCloud, but Microsoft is making this Azure Remote Rendering service available now in private preview. Granted, we can't go get it yet, and even if you want to get into it, Microsoft has to approve you, and you've got to have a pretty good use case for it. But but this is one of the first known quasi-public trials of Microsoft's new cloud streaming rendering services. And the reason I bring this up is, one, this is important because Microsoft is using this, obviously, to get feedback and learning about how you can render stuff in the cloud, stream it to a device, and interact with it in real time, you know, getting more feedback about latency and everything else that is so important to gaming in the cloud. But now they're doing it with the, under the banner of Azure Remote Rendering. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. The reason why I bring this up is we're going to be marching towards Game Developer Conference where Google is going to be announcing their game streaming service and platform, um, potentially some hardware along the way, and I suspect we're going to see a public trial or quasi-public trial or something to that effect. Now, Microsoft has already said xCloud trials are coming this year, but I think Google will more than likely beat Microsoft to the punch from the public trial. But people are going to freak out and be like, ah, oh, Google's you know running the game. They're doing all these trials first. They're going to, be, they're going to beat Microsoft. Um, 
the reason why I bring up Azure Remote Rendering is that Microsoft is already trialing this technology just under a different banner. So it's not like Microsoft are just sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for this stuff to launch. They are actively trialing it um, as we talk right now. Right now. So just keep that in mind. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, on the Sony side, interestingly enough, I was sent some job descriptions that Sony is absolutely working on technology to stream PlayStation games to any device. The, the job descriptions clear as day say streaming to any device. So we know that Sony is working on that. They've already had some capability. Remember, you can already stream to, I believe, a PC and like a PS Vita or something like that. Um, so it's not like this is a completely foreign world for them. I'll be curious to see when we learn more about that streaming solution coming from the Sony camp as well. It's, it's, it's going to be a streamtacular uh, 2019. So a bunch of good questions dropped this week, and I'm going to dive into them because it's always the favorite part of my week. Although the least favorite part of my week is trying to pronounce everybody's name because they are always kind of crazy. Uh, kicking it off here with Pogatha, Pogatha says, has there been any talk regarding making the user interface more consistent? For instance, matching up the scroll bars across the mobile apps and desktop apps and new office icon videos that show off a redesigned start menu icons with the desktop icons getting redesigned as well. Uh, yeah, so this is <laughs> this is an interest. I was thinking about this earlier today. And so I was trying to think, has it been two years since Microsoft announced Fluent? It's at least been a year uh, when we hit build, at least a year, it might be two, I can't remember. But Microsoft's interface, there's not, there's no design consistency across things like Skype, Xbox, built-in apps, and Office. I thought that, I was thinking that Fluent Design was going to kind of make all these things look and feel the same. But here we are, and they absolutely do not kind of, the, the design language of Fluent is just kind of sprinkled or, or about, really. It's hit or miss about where it's actually being applied. Um, I, <laughs> I would love for a very consistent UI from Microsoft, but we we haven't gotten it. They've talked about it for years, even prior to Fluent. Uh, they had Metro and they had a whole bunch of other things that kind of came came in about. And um, yeah, we, we haven't seen any of it. I hope we do, but I don't know how much of a priority it is. And clearly it wasn't a priority in the past couple years because despite the fact that they announced a new design language, all of their products and services are not adhering to it. And here we are uh, on March 1st, still talking about design consistency across the Microsoft UI. Uh, BDSRF says, Hi Brad, I saw your YouTube video about Nintendo rumors. Do you think Microsoft and Nintendo will announce whatever they're doing together at E3 in June? It would be perfect because Sony isn't going to E3 this year. I honestly do not know. Um, all I know is that they are working on something. I don't know how far along the relationship is. Uh, we know that Microsoft and Nintoni, 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 Nintendo have worked together in the past. Uh, with things like Minecraft and we have uh, crossplay and those sorts of things. So it's not like this is a brand new relationship, but I don't know how far along if these bigger goals and ambitions are. They, they could talk about them, but I, I, I candidly, I, I don't know and I don't want to give false speculation. So uh, Will R says, Brad, what are your thoughts on Apple getting away with MacBook keyboard gate? Even the newest MacBook with third-gen keyboards still have problems. Consumer Reports won't pull their MacBook recommendations, even though there's still clearly a serious problem with the keyboards. So one thing about Consumer Reports is that they're typically a lagging indicator. Uh, they, they, they're they very good at making recommendations on things that have already happened. And that's not putting Consumer Reports down, per se. It's just that they do surveys, and the surveys can't happen until consumers have the product, and, then, and that can't happen until the, the product has reached a certain level of volume. And so... It, it still could be coming, but there's been some serious issues with the MacBook keyboard. And so if you're not familiar with it, look up getting uh, dust under the keys of the butterfly switches. And Apple, I think, is on their third gen butterfly switch. They put a little membrane over it, thinking that was going to fix it. But there's still some problems with the third gen keyboard. Um, it, it, are they getting away with it? I mean, I think people know about it. It's not been a like the iPhone issue where they were, they were dropping uh, where you couldn't make calls or whatever, because if you put your hand on it, you were short circuiting the antenna, but yeah. Um, they, I mean, they've gotten a pass. I mean, I mean that's kind of hard to say it any other way. Uh, and old Amiga user asks, he says, do you think windows light will be as easy to maintain as Chrome or will there still be too much windows in it? This is a good question. And so right now, there's still a lot of Windows in Windows Lite. I need to do an updated video. I did a big, long write-up about Windows Lite this week um, and showed off. Uh, 
I've seen Windows Lite, and so I created a, a mock-up of it, and that way everybody can kind of get an understanding of what it looks like. Right now, the out-of-box experience on Windows Lite is still roughly the same as Windows 10. So it, like, it's all still kind of there, which makes me hesitant to say, yeah, it's going to be exactly like Chrome. Now, I know that they're going for instant on instant flash, which is what they call like, like the, the repurposing of the OS. Whether or not they will get there with the launch version, I don't know. But if it, if it fails to be as easy to maintain as Chrome OS, it will not do well. I, I still struggle to see how this is going to do exceptionally well anyways. Um, but the longer term ambitions of Windows Lite are pretty big. So we will see how this plays out. Uh, Team 56 says, Brad, do you know if there's if there's some high level ranking? Okay, he's talking about um, the Xbox and Nintendo stuff. Yeah, so I did a video on it quite literally yesterday. I didn't mean to to do so many videos this week, but um, because I kept getting so many questions, I figured I'd just do them out. So go watch that. Uh, just scroll down on the YouTube channel, and that'll that'll fill that up for you. Uh, Rick says, "Hi, Brad. Do you think we will see any foldable Windows devices this year?" Uh, what Surface device do you expect we will see this year? I don't know what we will see, but if we're going to see a device, it's going to be Centaurus. I don't believe it'll be Andromeda, and that would be coming later this year. There's also uh, Windows devices being made by OEM partners, I believe, under the banner of Janus or Janus, depending on how you want to pronounce that name. And so will I think we see some? I think we will more than likely see some prototypes, whether or not anybody's shipping anything this year. That's a good question. I, I mean... I can definitively say they're absolutely working on this stuff. Uh, releasing it is a totally different thing. I mean, that's marketing. They could have the product just sitting in a demo room. Be like, yeah, we're going to wait six months to launch it or announce it or anything like that. So getting the timing of launches is much more difficult than, hey, are they actually working on this stuff? And the last question comes from Simon says, now that Samsung, Huawei, and others have introduced foldable phones, do you think this will have any effect on Andromeda, or is this just another case of companies including a product and solution for a problem that currently doesn't exist? So foldable phones are interesting and premature, is my kind of honest take. It's not hard to understand the value of a foldable phone, right? You have a candy bar style phone, you make it twice as big, more screen real estate, great. Now, that being said, there's so many trade-offs currently that we don't know when or how the technology is going to mature to come to a point where it is truly better than the phones that we have today. For example, a lot of the screens are made of plastic, which is not great to be running your finger over compared to glass. So are we going to get to a foldable, pliable glass? Maybe. Um, we need to get the right thinness and form factor and battery life and camera placement and everything else because it's not it's not good enough just to be the same as a, a smartphone. It needs to be better in a truly way that justifies, one, not only the higher price, but the increased fragility of the device. I mean, think about how you're going to put a case on a lot of these phones, especially like the Samsung one. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. I don't think that they are a novelty by, by any means, but I don't think that we found the true use case. The biggest thing that made smartphones smartphones so valuable was honestly navigation because having a map in your pocket replaced that stupid foldable thing you had to bring out or printing out map quest directions that got you within the nearest mile of where you wanted to be and so navigation was the killer app in my opinion and then obviously cameras and everything else really made them useful but it was navigation so we need to find that killer use case for it and i don't think the killer use case for it is watching things on a larger screen because you can already watch video and everything else on a phone and phones have six and 6.5 inch displays or larger or smaller or whatever you're buying which is good but it's not great but would you spend another thousand dollars to go from a six inch screen to a 10 inch screen and only have to carry one device that's a personal decision you have to make that is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the technology to mature and get to a price point that is justifiable for the dual screens. I, it's not hard to see how these things are neat and, and have a function. The, the question is, do they have a mass market function uh, built inside that is more valuable than a standard smartphone? So, uh, guys, that wraps it up for this week. And you can always drop the questions. I post them up on throat.com. I usually tweet out the link. You can find me on at BDSams at Twitter. Uh, I try to interact with most people as much as I can. Um, sometimes I, I do miss them. But uh, thanks for the question, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you right back here next time.